And now we have a lovely talk from Amal on managing your research, your advisor, and your PhD. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, hi everyone. Um, so when I uh, thought about giving this talk, when I proposed this topic, is this okay? It, I, I hear an echo, so it's a bit weird for me. I'll move here. Um, okay, so when I uh, thought about giving this talk, it, really my main motivation was, you know, most PhD students don't really know what they're getting into when they start a PhD. And I always have felt, like over and over again over the years, that if people knew what to anticipate down the line, and they knew it a lit in a bit more detail, if they knew what to expect from their advisors, perhaps on a daily basis or on a yearly basis, you know, they would have, feel like they have a bit more control and that maybe they'd be able to do certain things differently. So that's really sort of the premise of this talk. Um, I want to walk you through a lot of things that I wish students knew, um, and you know, I hope that it'll help you. Now, I put this six-year timeline up, um, and so I have two things to say about that. Um, after I put this up, you know, this is exclusively focused on six years of your PhD or five years of your PhD, whatever that is, I asked the um, organizers uh, what the distribution of the room was, and it turns out about 50, 55 percent of you are, have not, are not even going to start a PhD this fall. Okay, so I am going to <laughs> include a fraction of the talk, the beginning of the talk. I want to talk a bit about, you know, advice to you about how to look for a PhD program, how to look for a PhD advisor. I'll start out with that. And the other thing, those of you in Europe and the UK would um, probably have guessed based on my five to six year timeline that this is an extremely, you know, US centric view. I got my PhD in the US, I, um, I have been faculty in the US. So, you know, take that into consideration. Some of the things are a bit US specific, but essentially for Europe and stuff, um, you know, squeeze that timeline. And there, there are things along the way that, uh, <laughs> that you know, I'll, I'll address, um, you know, I'll say how you should be thinking about it differently if you're not based in the US. Okay, so let's start with the pre-PhD, all right? So let's say you're one year, uh, you'll be applying this fall or you'll be applying next fall. You're thinking about whether you want to get a PhD. You haven't really decided yet. Um, so I want you to sort of look at the things that I'm going to say and try to imagine what this, you know, would be like and how you might make certain decisions about which program to pick. So let's get into certain really basic things. Um, the first question, of course, that, you know, comes up always, it's completely the standard one, um, you know, where should I be applying? Um, and really the question here is that, you know, you're trying to ask um, who are the PL faculty out there, if programming languages is what you're interested in, who are the PL faculty out there who would be a good match for me? Which are the PL departments that would be a good match for me? And you know, the, the first uh, bullet is really very obvious advice. Um, if you are in this room, you probably have been, you know, interacting with some PL person at your institution. You might have some undergraduate experience doing some amount of, you know, independent study, reading, um, research. Um, so they're obviously the best source of advice. Um, you know, they can sort of sit down with you, talk to you about what your interests are, um, and help you focus on where you should be looking. Um, another bit of advice, you know, that's uh, really um, sort of important uh, is, is to sort of look widely. You're here at ICFP, go to all the talks, think about what you're, what you're most interested in, narrow it down. What are the talks that you most enjoy? One of my PL colleagues, Matthias Felizen at Northeastern, likes to tell people, grab the proceedings from the last few major conferences, ICFP, POPL, PLDI, Uppsala, whatever interests you, and go through the abstracts, go through the intros. He says, read all the intros. That's quite a lot. <laughs> so now we're down based on your interest, but that is an, a piece of advice that's out there, all right? It might, uh, as you sort of start to zoom in on what you like, you would want, you should read some of the intros to the papers, um, you know, that are about on topics that you like. Um, okay, and you know, the last one <laughs> deserves saying, email or talk to faculty here um, whose work you're interested in. Um, and if you have questions about approaching people, you know, feel free to. I'm happy to talk about that. <laughs> Faculty love giving advice. They love chatting with you when you say, you know, I, I'm interested in a PhD. I'd like some advice. <laughs> so really, feel free to do that. You know, it's, they, they love it. OK. Um, I, I want to say this. The most important factor in deciding where to go for a PhD really ought to be your advisor. All right? And you want to try and narrow this down. You want to ask a lot of questions. You want to figure out, you know, who is the best fit, both in terms of research interests, their research interests, uh, something about their way of thinking appeals to you. Um, and you also want a good personal fit. All right? um, you want to find out what uh, sort of an advisor they are, uh, which really means you, know, um, you want to 
talk to, oh, I have that on the next slide, sorry. I'll, I'll jump to that. Um, so, and then the second most important thing after um, finding a good, uh, good advisor who's a good fit for you is your lab culture, all right? So once you're admitted to PhD programs, um, schools normally pay for you to come visit. Go to visit day, ask a lot of questions. Um, you know, you want to know what is the lab culture like? What are the students here like? How do they interact on a daily basis? Um, you know, you're going to learn a lot from your peers during the, your uh, PhD. And you, you really want to sort of, I have a warning up here, you know. I've, I've often found that labs where a lot of the students or a lot of the people work from home on a daily basis, they don't interact quite so much. Sometimes that can feel really isolating. Um, so it's something to sort of, um, you know, look for. Um, these are the kinds of things you want to want to look for and ask questions about. Okay. Um, typically less important in making your decision about where to go is things like um, financial incentives, um, the name or ranking of the institution, um, and you know, location. Of course, location can sometimes really matter for people, especially if you have a two-body problem. Uh, so I don't want to dismiss that entirely. It's just that you know, all other things being equal. These are probably the least important things. The advisor and lab culture really can have a massive impact on your life and career, in a sense. OK, um, so how do you find out if someone is a good fit? Um, so I already said this a little bit. Go to visit day and ask a lot of questions. Um, talking to their current and former students will tell you a lot. Find them alone. Ask them. <laughs> Okay, um, you know, because that really tells you who they've been like, what, you know, um, how they, are they on a day-to-day -day basis? What is it like working with them? Um, you want to ask, what can you expect to work on? So this is something that I think is, uh, can be very different um, in the U.S. compared to, the, um, to, to Europe. Um, in Europe, often, you know, there's already a funded grant. There is a project. It is well, you know, it is not completely well defined, but it's defined. And you will be working on that project. In the US, there tend to be, you know, sort of, there tends to be more freedom in terms of opportunities, um, you know, of picking a topic. And um, I'll get into this a little bit later, but, you know, usually you spend your first couple of years on a starter project, and then you can, um, def you know, sort of navigate a little bit more towards defining your own thing. But you want to ask uh, your potential advisor, how do you usually do this? How do you see yourself doing this? If I want to work on not the thing X that you are, have funding for right now, do you see yourself two years down the line applying for another grant that would fund my work? You know, what, what is your mode of operation really? Right? That way you know um, what, you're, what you're getting into. You don't know which way you want to go two years down the line or something, but you know, it tells you a little bit about what you're stepping into. Um, another big question is large projects versus individual. Um, projects. So, you know, this is something you really want to think about what your own preferences are, what the pros and cons are. Um, large projects have a large splash factor. You know, the entire community knows that there is, uh, in the U.S., for instance, there is a deep spec or something, <laughs> you know, like these very large uh, funded projects and grants. Um, so you, you get, you know, sort of the benefit of that. Um, but on the other hand, large projects have a lot of people on them. All right, and often it, um, you know, often the sad thing about large projects is, you know, of the very large number of students working on them, only a few end up being the stars. And so there's a certain dynamic to this, and you want to ask these questions. You want to find out about what the pros and cons are. Okay, um, and individual projects have have other cons. You know, I mean, you you could have your own thing, but sometimes you know, not having other people to interact with, so on, on a technical basis, on a daily basis, can feel a little bit isolating. So it's really a question that you need to ask about yourself and what you like. Okay, um, then um, you want to ask um, advisors, you know, do they, do they have a particular philosophy or strategy in terms of training students for academia, if that's what you want to do, or for research labs? Is there something they do differently? And this just shows you how reflective they are about this process, really. You know, um, how do they think about it? What do they do differently for different students, depending on what their goals are? Um, and then, of course, you know, look at, look at the results. In other words, their students, their current students. How are they doing? Um, you know, um, their former students, what kind of jobs did they get? Or, you know, and, and then don't just take this as, you know, data. Um, there's a story behind every individual and every student that graduated with any advisor. 
but use it as an opportunity to say oh, you know, so i i feel like perhaps some of your students didn't publish quite a lot during this what what was that about? and it may have just been you know a couple of students particular situations i'm just sort of saying look at this stuff and ask and uh, you know sort of find out more okay all right um so let's go into year one and by the way please feel free to sort of interject and ask questions um you know i'm happy to answer as I go along. Okay, so year one. Um, so year one, you know, there's uh, the typical stuff. You dive in. Um, you have uh, research. You should be doing research. You ha are typically taking one or two classes. Um, and may maybe you're also TAing your first year. And really, the most important this thing to say here is almost cliched advice by now. But you know, focus on research. Don't just let it go by the wayside. Um, just because you know that's what you're there for and the other thing can sort of suck up all of your time but don't let this important thing go by the wayside um uh so there's this concept of a starter project um most of us in the u.s definitely um think in terms of a starter project when a student first comes in you give them a slightly well-defined problem you still don't know whether it's completely well defined whether you can just sit down and solve it um but you know there is something that um, we, we try to propose that we know would lead to a good research paper um, and it would be an opportunity for the student to pick up a lot of technical skills these might be technical skills where you're pr doing proofs and so you figure out exactly you know in detail how to do that um, you might be um, learning to use a proof assistant uh, you might be implementing something you might be doing some empirical evaluations right so whatever technical skills that we um, sort of want to teach you as part of making you part of our group um, is, you know, are, are sort of ideally uh, something you will have an opportunity to become familiar with. Um, then the other thing that I feel is sort of happening in that first year is, uh, you know, you're, you're getting to know your advisor. You're building a relationship with your advisor. Um, and stuff that matters here, I mean, everyone sort of expects a weekly meeting, right? So you meet with your advisor, you have technical meetings every week. Um, but it's important, you know, here students can get into weird patterns. Um, don't wait for the next week's meeting. If you're sort of stuck, if you want some advice, pop in, ask a question, right? Make progress. Otherwise, you're, you're sort of wasting a large number of days before you get to the, that next meeting. Um, but there's also a sort of tension between that and becoming more self-reliant over time. So, you know, um, assess whether or not to, to, to do that. Um, Something that often I've found students don't really know is um, when I, when you have a project and we're meeting every week to, to talk about our joint project, I'm really expecting you to be keeping notes because this is your project, all right? And sometimes I've found that first year students will just walk in and not really do that. <laughs> and, you know, that is, I don't know whether that's completely <laughs> obvious to many of you, but um, it's a thing that I've found often, you know, comes up over and over again. So I, I'm trying to say you are the manager of your research and you are the manager of your research project. So part of this is, you know, you keeping track of these, these weekly, daily things, tracking progress on them, and so on. Okay? Um, all right. Um, a different thing to say. So, you know, you're going in in year one, and uh, really there's a lot of different stuff thrown at you. And one other thing that I want to throw at you is make sure you attend talks. Don't be isolated. Go, go to hiring talks in your department. Um, that gives you a sense of, you know, breadth to see other areas of computer science, to see how do people explain concepts to an audience who are not specialists in their area. If you start to do this early on in your first year and you know, keep doing it consistently throughout, um, you really are a sort of different person by the time you graduate. Um, it, it helps you figure out slowly skills that you will one day need to use yourself you know, in terms of how we present things. Um, and it just makes you sort of more well-rounded and able to discuss a variety to of topics within CS, not just your particular area. Um, let me bring up imposter syndrome. <laughs> Um, you will inevitably, most people will, almost all people will, feel something like this, you know, um, early on and maybe will continue to for a very, very long time, many of us do. Um, so, you know, it's, it's imposter syndrome, it's, all, it's also this feeling that you're a first year, everyone else around you are second, third, fourth, fifth year students, right? They're faculty. They, of course they all know more than you do. And that's okay. 
right? It deserves to be said that that is completely okay. That is how this process works. Um, you know, but I, I want to say that, you know, many students um, become quite anxious about this. And I, I think you're feeling judged, right? You're a first year, you want to demonstrate that you know stuff. There's this, there are these daily interactions where you want to be able to participate more or contribute more or have your ideas recognized. All of these feelings come up. But you are the, the sort of most junior person in there, and so some of this is completely expected. Um, and it's important to remember that your department, your lab, your research group, this is a safe space. It ought to be. I, I believe it is in most places. Um, you know, and you want to think of it as such. You want to think of it as you know, the space where you are free to make mistakes and learn from them. All right, and you will have people who support you and answer your questions and so on and help you grow. All right? And that's a very, very important thing. You are not being judged from day one because you don't know anything yet, frankly. All right? And so it's the growth that matters. It is the fact that this is a safe space and you should be using it as an opportunity to grow that matters. Take risks. Go ask questions. Make a fool of yourself giving your first talk. It will be bad. It's fine. <laughs> that is the process. It has been forever the process of training PhD students. OK? Um, I want to show you this slide. I really, you know, sometimes it's mind boggling. Students come in their first year knowing so little, not really being part of the research community. And by the time they leave in year five or year six, they are our colleagues. That's a phenomenal transformation. And that's something to keep in mind. OK? <laughs> All right. Um, OK. So any questions? All right, um, common pitfalls to avoid um, early on. Um, don't let the urgent trump the important. Classes seem urgent, TAing seems urgent. Develop a sort of weekly routine or a daily routine where you do make time for research as, as much as possible. Um, I'm fully aware that <clears throat> when you enter a PhD program, just based on the bullets that I've shown you so far, I'm asking you to do everything at once. Yeah, <laughs> I am. <laughs> Um, the issue here is balance. Try to balance all of these things out. They are all important in some measure or another. All right? um, you just sort of make the best decision uh, you can based on what's the next deadline, what's the next uh, thing due, and, and so on. Right? Um, this pattern of weekly meetings <laughs> sometimes encourages students to do work the 24 to 36 hours before that meeting and not really do any research the rest of the week. That's not a good pattern. <laughs> I've noticed that undergrads who are particularly brilliant in <laughs> you know, and, and have gotten through all of college without really, you know, by doing some work at the very end, <laughs> often fall into this trap. <laughs> they think they can do research that way. But you can't do research that way. Research is something that you, you need to develop um, consistent work habits. Um, you know, it's sort of that daily thinking, that daily struggle, that daily progress that, that really brings about um, a good rate of you know, growth and learning and progress. Um, if you sort of are only spending a day or so doing some work just so you can show something to your advisor the next day, it, you'll go slower. That's all I'll say. Right? Um, yeah, minimal effort isn't, isn't enough for research, I think. Um, so you need to develop different work habits. Um, <laughs> avoiding your advisor. <laughs> I didn't get anything done this week, so I'm just going to try to avoid my advisor. If maybe she's busy. Ah, good, I can get out of this. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's something even I've done as a PhD student. It's totally a normal thing <laughs> to feel. <laughs> um, but, and you know, when your advisor is busy, they may not push you <laughs> because they're busy too. Um, but, you know, you're the one who sort of loses valuable research time, and it's important to be aware of that. Um, check in with them, meet with them, you know, more than once a week even. Um, but, but keep this progress growing, because even if you do just a little bit and talk to them, that's better than, you know, just sort of delaying it and avoiding them. Um, okay. The other thing is investing time that first year, I mean, throughout really, and in making friends in your lab. Um, these people are going to be your support network, your learning network. Um, you're going to, they're, they're helpful in that you have, you know, daily interactions with them or uh, where you get to tell them what it is that you're working on. 
they don't really know the details, but you get to practice telling them what it is you're working on. And that is such a useful thing to be doing on a daily basis, explaining this crazy nitty gritty stuff, you know, sort of stepping away from something really technical that we're doing, coming, you know, popping out and being able to explain to another person in their terms what it is that you're doing, why it matters, and so on. Right? It's it's one of the most important skills we really develop. I mean, I use it as a professor. <laughs> we all sort of need it and use it um, throughout our careers. Um, and it helps you feel connected to others, right? Um, OK. Now I want to jump into the role of the advisor. I found that often people don't really know what a PhD advisor provides, besides the weekly meetings and the technical discussions and support. So I want to reflect on this a little bit. Maybe some of this is obvious. Maybe some of it isn't. OK. So I've talked about the starter project. Yes, your advisor helps you pick a starter project. Um, your advisor um, should make sure that it is something that people care about. And I've written this under a starter project bullet, but really that, that point is to me, I've always thought that the, one of the biggest things an advisor can do for a PhD student is to help them zero in on problems, problems that the community cares about. Okay? Advisors who give you problems that people won't care about are wasting your life. All right? <laughs> so that's, that's a really big one. Um, uh, the, the project, you know, initially that they're, help, that they're sort of, you know, giving you or, or having you work on should help develop technical skills. Um, some advisors have this thing um, where they, they have a certain style of advising where they'll say, I would like to be working in this area. How about you go and read all of these research papers? And I'll re read them too, but how about you go read all of these research papers and find a problem? I found that with beginning PhD students, um, you know, especially those coming straight out of undergrad, I don't think that this is a that is this is such an effective strategy. It works with some students who are able to find a problem, but I think for a lot of them it doesn't quite. So if I'm criticizing any advisors in their style, I'm very sorry. <laughs> okay, um, but you know, if you are, do have one of these advisors who has a style of go read these papers and find a problem, then maybe you go read the papers and but after a certain amount of time, sort of say to them. Um, I'm having trouble with this. Um, can you help me find a problem? Try to figure out for yourself, reflect for yourself, how long should it take me to find a problem? And if you found that months have gone by and you have not come up with a problem, that's what I mean, that you know, sometimes this, this just sort of delays things. Um, it keeps you from making quicker progress. So there's a certain dynamic to this that you need to sort of be able to see from the outside, and I'm hoping that me saying this does that, so that you can go back to your advisor and say, I need help. Let's, let's figure out what that problem might be together or something of that sort. OK. Um, an advisor, in ideal circumstances, helps make you part of the research community. Now, you might think that that just happens through technical discussions, through uh, technical support, teaching you technical skills, but it's far more than that. The advisor, your advisor sits in their office every meeting they have with you, and ideally what they should be doing is they should be telling you, how does the community think? Okay? That is what I mean by they are helping make you par uh, part of the research community. You just arrived into this research community. You don't know all the different prayers. I know how Derek thinks about certain bits of research. I know how, uh, who else is like that? <laughs> uh, maybe I know how Kathy might think about certain bits of research. Um, right? So we advisors are representatives of that community in that room with you every week. All right? If what we should be sitting there and doing is saying, OK, so if we present this idea this way, so-and-so who does that kind of research is going to have this objection. How do we deal with it? All right? I often am like, well, Bob Harper would say, <laughs> you know, because I know these people. I've been talking to them. I know what their research thinking is. I know what their standards are. And that is what we bring to you. And that is how, by talking with you and at you constantly, we make you part of the research community. We get you to know players whom you don't know yet. Right? And advisors who aren't doing that are, you know, perhaps you will, it will take you longer to feel part of the research community. So here's my advice to you. If your advisor doesn't quite do that, 
encourage that conversation. Take it in that direction, not every week, but once in a while, right? When you're sort of at a strategic point or you're discussing how to present a certain idea or whether to in, go down a certain path in some research, try to take the conversation into these ideas of what, how, what would so-and-so think or you know, how do you think this would be perceived or do you think this is valuable? I'm talking in generalities, of course, it always depends on the specifics of the uh, particular research, but you know, that's something that you can perhaps start the conversation yourself and encourage your advisor to sort of venture off more into that territory. Okay? Um, and then they help you develop research taste and high research standards, right? What are the standards of the community um, and how should we be doing certain work? How rigorous should our proofs be when we write, up, uh, when we write them up? Um, you know, um, and, and I think that in these research meetings, you want to sort of have frequent discussions of why are we working on the problem that we are working on? What are its benefits? What do we go out there and tell the community once we're done that you know, this is what we get out of it? Sometimes I've found that work can get extremely technical. You go down a certain path and, you know, in our weekly meeting, I'm starting to say, oh my God, this is just getting, this is just like, you know, uh, we're all in the weeds, like this is just too complicated. You sort of step back and say, so what's our message here? Are we providing the community, people with a recipe to do X in this situation, right? That helps sort of frame what is the value of your work. Because if you're constantly in the weeds, maybe, maybe there's not as much value as you think. You have to be able to step back and step out. Okay? Um, so these are the kinds of interactions you're looking for with your advisor. Right? Um, advisor versus boss. <laughs> I really don't think that it's helpful when students think of their advisor as a boss, or exclusively as a boss. Um, I've often found that it leads to this mentality that oh, I'm just doing all of this work because they want me to do it. And, you know, um, you're not just a worker. Um, you're, you know, the most important product of your PhD is you. And that's really important to remember. You're doing the work for you because it helps you develop, it helps you learn, it helps you become a full-fledged researcher. All right? Um, and your advisor is, so, is your boss. Yes, they do get to tell you what to do, <laughs> in a sense. But they're also your mentor. They're your partner in this research. They benefit just as much as you do. You have this shared interest. Um, they're your collaborator. They're also your evaluator. <laughs> they're judging you. They're supposed to, right? They're supposed to judge you to help make you better, to, to sort of give you feedback on how to do things differently on a daily basis, how to think differently about certain problems, how to, you know, sort of, um, like what standards to apply. They're also your evaluator in the sense that, you know, a few years down the road, they're going to write a letter for you. <laughs> so yes, there is that. But, and they will not be dishonest in those letters. I mean, they will not be like brutal either or anything. But yes, they are that too, right? It's a very complex relationship. Um, but you're not just exclusively trying to impress them. Um, and the other thing to remember is sort of the things that you do learning early on are not something that you will be assessed on uh, when your advisors eventually get to the point of writing letters for you for job applications and so on. They are looking at how much you have matured, how much you have grown, and who you are now, all right? And they've seen that progression. Um, they are your promoter and a source of support and, you know, far more than that uh, in ideal circumstances. Okay. Um, advisors are also busy. <laughs> They are all extremely busy. Sometimes, despite their best intentions, they will not have time because they're juggling so many different things. All right, and in this situation, I'm constantly juggling so many things, and I have the best of intentions, but often I, I do end up getting into these periods where I'm ignoring my students a bit, or at least ignoring one or two of them or something. Um, you know, I've found that my students, some of them, have really great strategies for engaging me. <laughs> they know that I want to be engaged. I want to be engaged on a technical basis. Right? It, some of them, um, I take the train home every day, it's an hour long ride, so some of them print something out, a page or two, and hand it to me before I jump on the train. <laughs> <laughs> they figured it out. <laughs> I will read it. <laughs> um, you know, what, what else? Some of them have this thing that they'll just send me a short email when they thought about a certain thing. Huh, I was thinking, should we do this, this, this? And they know that that will get into my head and that I will have the time to think about it. Even if I'm on vacation, if you send me an email, I won't reply maybe, but you know, I will have a chance to process it, to think about it, and when I get back, I have done that thinking. These are all techniques of engagement. So this is me, figure out how your advisor works and how to engage them. All right? my, my theory is that 
they just get busy, and you just need to sort of provide things in maybe smaller bits or something occasionally to sort of pull them back in. All right? Um, now, you want to make sure your needs are met. So technical engagement, that's sort of the one I was just talking about. Um, but you also have, you know, you, you want their help and support and advice uh, in terms of things like re uh, research planning and thesis planning, um, career advice, planning for job search. And by the way, on this point, it's very important to keep your advisor on the same page as you. If you want to become a faculty member in two years, uh, you should tell them that. If you want to have a job later on in a research lab, you should tell them that. It helps them craft a path for you to, to be sort of thinking in the background about what is the best development. They might be at a conference and they might be like, oh, so um, one of my students, are, you know, maybe you want a job in uh, Seattle and so I run into someone from MSR. Well, this is a great opportunity to promote my student. Right? You want them to always know what you're thinking, what your goals are, so that they can help you. Um, and then there are other things that you want to pull them in and sort of say, you need to teach me this. I would really like to learn. Um, if you want to become an academic, grant writing skills, you know, have a conversation. Say, is there an opportunity for us to do this? Can I learn about this? You know, are, um, you know it may be that they're, uh, they want to write a grant uh, to fund your project. That's an absolutely perfect opportunity for you to be learning how grants are written. Um, reviewing papers, you know, when you're third year or so, um, they should be giving you some of their um, papers to review, or one or two, whatever you would be most suitable for, so that you and giving you advice on how to review papers, um, how to pitch your research, the elevator pitch, like when you run into a famous researcher <laughs> at a conference and you have five minutes to tell them what your research is about. How should we do that? You know, um, what's their advice? Things like that. So basically what I'm saying is these are all the things you want to be able to get from your advisor. If you're not getting them, ask. You know, sometimes advisors don't think to do these things or don't think to have certain conversations. Sometimes the weekly meeting time ends a little too quickly and we didn't get there. All right, ask. Um, I think most are willing to do it. It's just sometimes they don't think of it on a daily basis. <sighs> Pressure to publish. <laughs> okay, so often um, students will have concerns like, you know, how many papers should I be publishing during my PhD? How, you know, by what year do I need to have my first paper? Um, I don't know how specifically, I, I don't want to address exactly those questions. I just want to say a few things about this. Um, my ideal, uh, and again, this is somewhat US specific because you have five years and you have time for a starter project, but my ideal is, you know, I like students to sort of finish a first paper on whatever their starter project is, depending on how ambitious this was. You know, it could take two years, three years even. Um, and I have certainly assigned some ambitious starter projects, I will admit. Um, but with that full cycle, writing, you know, doing the research, writing the paper, all of that does is it gives you, um, it allows you to experience this full process of, um, of getting some research done and publishing it. Um, you know, you get to write the paper and then you get to engage with the community because your reviewers will give you comments back. You get to see what this process is like. How mean are people <laughs> when, they, when they review your papers? You, you talk to your advisor in terms of like, oh, well, what did they mean? How bad is this? How good is this? Right? Um, but you become more part of the community as, through that process. Um, after that, after you have one paper, I'd really like to tell students, it's okay, take your time. Don't be in a rush. Don't think I have to publish my next paper and my next paper and my next paper. A PhD is a substantial sort of amount of time. It is the, perhaps the only time in your life that you have to just sort of immerse yourself in something big and new. All right, so if you have a deeper question, uh, something you know that, of course, in consultation with your advisor, like this is plausible but hard, um, take the time. Do read, you know, go familiarize yourself with an entirely new literature if you have to. Um, take time to think. Take time to struggle. It's all right. This is like around the third to fourth year, right, where people start to develop. You know, you can you can actually take the time if you're not constantly responding to this noise in your head. I have to publish. I have to write the next paper. Okay, that keeps you from not immersing yourself and not going and asking a deeper question. So you have to shut out that noise for a little bit. It's very valuable. Oh, what just happened? Okay. Um, yeah, um, and and often I've found that people who go and take that time, then suddenly they sort of emerge from this 
period with a burst of like three papers or something. And this is a rather common pattern. I've seen it happen with many students, right? Um, so that's the payoff. And then that, that burst, in fact, then often material, you know, sort of continues after they graduate as well because they've, they've laid us an initial foundation for an entirely new line of work, perhaps, okay? So there's a big payoff to that. Um, and of course, you know, there are ways of continuing to publish. You can, you can continue to be sort of not lead author, second or third author on other projects that are going on in your group. And that is a way of, of you know, developing your breadth, but also being able to publish. Um, but really remember that a few high quality papers are better than a lot of so-so papers or a lot of low hanging fruit. And senior people in the community very much believe that. Okay? Um, all right. So, <laughs> risks. Research always comes with risks. And this first line is something you should remember. Matthias Fleisen says this very often. Um, it's not research if it can't fail. And there's a real risk of research failing. Um, there are other risks too. You might, get, you might feel like you're about you know, three months away from writing something up about the topic and you might get scooped. Someone else publishes something that's quite similar, but you know, not exactly the same, but it sort of took the wow out of your result, right? These are all sad things and they're difficult things. Um, you have to just sort of, I don't know, I don't have a good answer to that one. It happens, um, you know, that's just what research comes with. Um, this other question is, is sort of um, a, a bigger one and, and something that's hard. Um, will people care if, you, if you're working on a big problem and you solve this deep problem? Will, will the community care? I don't know, sometimes, you know, you have to have this conversation about um, what are the odds that we'll be able to come up with a solution that is practical and convincing, right? And you can't tell, you have to try. So that's the risk. Um, you know, you just have to kind of go through it. Um, you wanna, but you want to sort of constantly be having this conversation. Are there compelling applications if we keep at this, even if this is a very long-term sort of problem? What do we, how do we, you know, do we think it's worthwhile, right? Um, okay, key discussions with advisor. I'm gonna run out of time now. <laughs> I sort of said a lot. Um, I just want to go through a, a few quick things. Um, so year one, you know, you are talking about a starter project, but really you should be having conversations about why this research, how does it advance the state of the art, and why should people care, all right? Um, and you want to sort of think, I think every six months to one year, you want to have a meeting with your advisor, which is about research planning, which is about sort of, you know, where am I, where am I going, all right? So some of these questions are in that vein. Um, you should be checking in about what are your career goals? What are your research preferences? What are you liking? Are you liking the starter project? Are you liking the particular daily things that you do as part of this project? Is this something that appeals to you? Would you like to continue? Um, year two is sort of more of the, of the same. You know, do you like this kind of work? What would you, but start talking about what would you like to do after this first project? Right? Um, what are your sort of dreams and ambitions out of being in perhaps a part of the group? What are the conversations that have been emerging? What are the ideas that you have? Where would you like to go with it? Um, year three, I, this one's sort of important. Um, this is where you start planning your dissertation, right? What you want to do, what your goals are. Um, so you really want to, I, I like to th at this point start to say, um, yeah, we should refine plans, but let's work backwards. Um, Let's talk about where you want to be. Do you want an academic position at the very end? Or do you want a research position? Um, you know, if you want an academic position, what will be the story of your research? That's a really critical thing. Um, and I don't know if you're wondering what, you, what I mean by story of your research, but that's sort of like, what, am, what is the community going to say when you graduate? This is your research. This is what was happening in the, in the world or in the community or in the re state of the art in the literature before your work came along. This is what you did, and this is why it's important, right? Why what you did matters, why it's an important result. Um, and, you know, is that story compelling enough for academic positions? That's another consideration they, that tends to be harder than, um, you know, for, for research lab positions. Um, uh, things like, uh, when do you want to graduate? What intermediate deadlines that imposes? Choosing committee members, helping you plan. Who are the, you know, people out there who would be most engaged with you as part of reading your dissertation? Who would be able to give you good feedback? Um, these are things that your advisor is able to consult, advise you on because they know the players out there. They know the personalities and so on. Um, and then job applications. Where to apply? Um, again, what are your goals, ambitions, or geographical constraints? Um, and you want to now start having discussions about, you know, that train you in a way to think about what am I going to be doing for the next five to ten years? Um, 
how do I tell a compelling research story in a do job talk? Um, what are, you know, an advisor should be encouraging you to sort of at least start thinking and reflecting on what do you want to teach? What, you know, what, um, if you have go, go apply for academic jobs, someone might ask you what are your grant writing plans or your funding plans? So you just need to become mature enough and understand some of these things so that you, you don't feel like you're sort of caught, you know, unawares when you're in an interview situation. Um, and then I have stuff about developing a network, um, but I'm going to just sort of step over that and you know these slides will be um, on uh, the website. There's one thing I want to say. Um, what is your network? Networking gets a really bad rap. I think most of the time people think, oh, I just have to go schmooze. No, um, that's not what this is about. We are part of a research community. There are a subset of people who know your work extremely well. They are your collaborators. You work with them on papers. They know every detail inside and out. It's all good. But you need to develop this second circle of like-minded colleagues in your area. These are the people who work in your area, um, who will be the ones who will write the paper, sorry, who will read the papers that you write. And they will be the ones who will say, I like this or I don't. Here's the problem that I have with it. They're the ones who will help make you better by giving you feedback and by critiquing you. you know, right? so, and, and eventually, they will be the ones who go out there and champion your work and are able to explain it to others who aren't quite reading the papers in detail. Right? So this network is a really, really valuable thing. And to be honest, you know, we, um, we are part of this research community because these are the people we value. These are the people who engage with us intellectually and help make us better. Um, so you want to develop that network of people. And again, you know, your advisor can help push you in certain directions. You can uh, sort of talk to people who work on your topic or a similar topic at conferences. You know, but start to engage with them. Um, they're your friends and promoters. All right. <coughs> Takeaways. Um, I'm kind of over time. <laughs> I'm a minute over. Um, but just to leave you with a few takeaways, I'm, if you're looking for, P if you're applying to PhD programs next year or whatever, please keep in mind, find an advisor who is the right research fit. All right? If you don't, if you just go to a school where you're like, oh, OK, um, yeah, maybe I'll work with this person. Seems kind of interesting. I'm not entirely sure I'm interested in their research. And then you're not interested in their research. This isn't good for the advisor. This isn't good for you. It just ends in unhappiness. You know? um, so, so try to sort of reflect and figure out who you are and what you like before you commit to this long-term thing. Um, yeah, um, I'll say this. Um, no advisor will be perfect. All right? There are lots of advisors who aren't very nice advisors anyway. <laughs> you want to avoid those. But even the ones who are nice advisors will not be perfect. No one is good at doing everything well. All right? And what you want to do is you want to manage your own PhD. That's the topic of the, t of the talk, right? You want to be able to find other mentors um, for things that your advisor might not be so good at. Okay? Um, so, or you want to find strategies to engage your advisor in helping you things with things that you know you need, but maybe they aren't quite thinking about it. Um, and then balance time spent on your own research versus being a good citizen of your lab, um, someone who gives other people feedback, et cetera. But you also need to find time for your own research. Um, and finally, you know, really what this is about is reflecting on your progress and being able to make corrections along the way or do things differently. OK? Um, that's it. Thanks. Uh -huh. What are common failure modes that you see? <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. Um, don't those pitfalls lead to failure modes? <laughs> that's how I would put it. Um, that's why I call them pitfalls, I guess. Because um, if they go unchecked, they might lead to failure. <laughs> sort of a cop-out answer. But <laughs> and I'll be on the panel this afternoon. Evening, so you can have more. Time.